Welcome to our bonus podcast on the Real Science of Sport podcast uh, with myself, Mike Finch, and Professor Ross Tucker. And these are relatively short little podcasts around very interesting subjects that uh, we often can't really get the time to do an hour to hour and a half, but uh, we like to just chat about some interesting discussions that Ross and I have had and stuff that's happened on Twitter as well that uh, allows us to do a little bit of an explanation around something. And of course, uh, at the moment, we are in the middle of this pandemic crisis and around the world, uh, moms and dads are uh, having their kids at home and doing all sorts of homeschooling. So today we thought we would look at how to turn your youngster into a sports scientist. I've always wanted to be a sports scientist. The closest I've ever got is the fact that I know Ross. Um, so I'm gonna ask Ross to maybe, maybe answer my questions around this. First of all, sports science, of course, for the average kid out there, it's probably a very fascinating uh, part of in the life and how they do things. but what do you think children need to know at the very basic level about physiology and sport? Well, I think that even if there wasn't a COVID induced homeschooling crisis, this would still be a really cool challenge to give to people is to use sports science to learn how to think systematically about things. And in fact, I often try and encourage people to adopt a bit of science in their own thinking, because when our listeners are training, at any level, whether they're training for weight loss or for performance or for competitions, they are making training decisions based on data. They may not think of it as data because it's how they feel. It's do they have tired legs? Do they feel like training? Yes or no? Maybe it's power output, maybe it's heart rate variability, but everyone is making decisions based on some kind of feedback. That feedback is data. And your ability to make good decisions is a function of how well you understand the quality of the data and what other factors might influence the data. So what sports science gives you, or rather what science gives you, scientific thinking, is a way to understand the world and make better decisions. And that's what you wanna use sports science to teach your kids, because it's a cool way to yeah. teach them about confounding variables, cause and effect, uh, measurement errors, like you measure, you could put, and this is a really basic experiment, get three different bathroom scales and get everyone in your household to weigh themselves on three different scales, they won't all weigh the same because the, the tool varies from one tool to the next. So you might weigh 87.6 on one scale, 86.8 on another and 88.1. So which one's the truth, you see? So then you've already learned something about measurement and it's, you haven't even gotten into the theory of physiology and science yet. So that's, that's, where, the, that's where the interesting stuff I think comes in here. So. I think you can challenge people in an activity that they're passionate about and then use it to, to improve the quality of their thinking. I, I always think that, um, and I, I look at kids and uh, 10 year olds and 14 year olds about how when you're young, you're kind of fearless and kind of slightly, you feel you're kind of immortal in many ways and you can do anything and you don't know, get tired and you don't need to get fit and you hardly ever get injured. Um, if we had to say to, let's say, 16-year-old or 12-year-old Joshua, who loves a bit of rugby and plays a bit of cricket and that sort of thing, what he needs to know about his body as that sort of age group, what, what would you say to him in a sports science context? He has to learn about body awareness and management because it comes back to what I said there before. The differentiating thing that's going to make for a good versus a bad athlete or a successful versus an unsuccessful sportsman is how they understand and spend their resources. So you have a finite capacity to train. You can't do 16 hours a day of weightlifting. You've only got one hour. How should you use that one hour? The answer to that question is different on a Monday compared to a Wednesday. So what Joshua has to understand is when does he need to pull lever X and when does he need to pull lever Y? And if he pulls lever X, he shouldn't pull lever Y and if vice versa. And, and the ability to understand that is what's most important. That's what a coach gives you if the coach yeah. is good. That's what a scientist should be giving you if the scientist is good. So it's really that, that issue of body management and awareness. And that comes from being systematic about how you ask questions and then how you answer those questions in a controlled way. And that's what research is. I mean, that sounds very theoretical. So I'm going to ask you to give me a sort of a slightly more practical mm -hmm. example of that. So Joshua is a rugby player uh, 12 years to th 12 to 14 years of age uh, 
how does what you've just said impact how he learns about his body? What is he doing and what is he taking note of? I think at that age, he's probably a little bit, so I'm, I'm a big fan of the idea that up till, up till like your adolescence, you, you don't train, you play. So yeah. I think Joshua there should be actually going out to play. And, and play means that some days he's going to try and kick a ball into a bucket 20 meters away. And he's going to measure how many times he can do it. And he's going to see how accurately he can do it. And he's going to play with different kicking techniques. He's going to try to pass the ball from 10 meters to hit a target that his dad has painted on the wall. And he's going to see how often. So he's challenging himself in a playful way. And he's not really systematic about it because it's, <laughs> I think the moment you become systematic about play, it kind of stops being play. So, yeah. so like, let, let him explore, you know, let him make up rules of a game of his own in the back garden and, and just to become better at being creative. When he becomes older and he's 16, 17, now he's got to do some assessments. He's got to be self-assessing. He's got to be measuring things. And for instance, one of those is weight training, which he'll start doing at the age of 16 to 18. How heavy should he lift? How often should he lift? How many sets should he do of that? What types of exercise? Is his technique good? So it's at this point that a, a basic experiment might be to set up his, his smartphone and record himself measuring, uh, record himself lifting in order to ensure that his technical execution is appropriate. Then he's got to start doing things like monitoring muscle soreness. If he does five sets of bicep curls, does he stay sore for three days? Whereas if he did four, he might have stayed sore for one day and he could have trained again on day, day three. So he's got to start then keeping a logbook and he's got to be systematic. Like what's the load? What was my perception of effort? How many sets? How many reps did I do? How did I feel afterwards? That's the kind of like research component that anyone can do. So I'm going to throw a bit of a challenge at you then and say, if I was going to design a sports science experiment with my 14 year old son, I don't have a 14 year old son, they've looked older than me than that now, but there's a couple of things that I always think when it comes to experiments, you have to have a control. There's also things like the placebo effect. Um, and then there's obviously a result. What could, uh, what could dad or mom and daughter or dad and son or whatever combination you want, What's a good example of a simple experiment which will show how experiments work in sports science? Yeah, so this is cool stuff. Uh, so let's <laughs> let's take okay. So before we before we think, because you're right, you need to have some control group and so on, and you're going to teach your kid how to think logically about these things in this process. The very well, just, first just, thing, just define just define what those I've mentioned them. Can you define control placebo result? Yeah, so, so know what we're talking about. So, so let's, let me do that as part of the sequence of things that I think you've got to consider. The start point for your study is a question. You have to have a question in mind. Like that's the purpose. That's your why. Like what am I trying to answer here? Do I want to explore whether eating a certain food makes me perform better? Do I want to explore uh, whether lifting certain weights makes me more sore than others or wh whatever it is? There's a question you want to answer. That question has to be followed by hypothesis. You have to speculate to some degree about what you're going to find. And the reason your hypothesis matters is because that leads you to understand what might confound it. Because if you don't, if you don't have a clear hypothesis or research question, then you can't try and head off all the little factors that could actually end up biasing your result, right? So your hypothesis leads you to identify bias and confounding factors. That in turn allows you to formulate what your control should be. And a control is basically, for the purpose of this one we'll get to now, is it's the situation had I done nothing. Okay? Right. So let's say, let's say it's a training study. We're going to take Joshua and we're going to improve his, his fitness abilities by doing regular shuttles up and down in the driveway. Okay? The control group is what would have happened had we not done anything with Joshua? So in other words, in this instance, it might be his performance on day zero. Mm -hmm. So he serves, he's going to serve as his own control. He's going to serve as his own baseline if, in this instance. And we're going to compare him on day five, day 10, day 15, and day 20 after a bit of training work to see if he can improve relative to himself. That's, in this instance, control. What we don't have is a group. You know, ideally, we'd have Joshua and 10 of his mates coming over. And we'd put five of them on one intervention 
and five of them on another, and then we could compare A to B. So Joshua and his mates in group A are going to do shuttle runs every day, whereas his mates, Tim and five friends, are going to do cycling. And we're going to see which of those improves running performance more, for instance, a simple example. Yeah, it's a great one. Uh, yeah, so once we, a, uh, carry on. Anyway, so once we've identified either a control group or a baseline, and because it's Joshua in lockdown, it's like we're not going to do a 20-person study. He's his own baseline. Then we can design our experiment. And our experiment is the intervention. It's the training session. It's the diet. It's the sleep patterns, whatever it is that you want to do. And then you do the experiment, and then you assess the result relative to your hypothesis. And that's, that's science, except scaled down to make it doable in the back garden. So, for instance, if Joshua stayed up until 11 o'clock at night and then did a session the next day and then the next night he went to bed at 8 o'clock and did the same session and judged out whether he was performing better, he could hypothesize or come to the conclusion that more sleep was better. That's a cool one. So let's say you've got a standardized exercise task. It's, uh, it's 10 times 200 meter shuttles with one minute rest or some, whatever. You take your pick. It could be a a 500 meter run around the block, maybe. Imagine trying to do that at six different times a day. You're gonna wake Joshua up at 5 a.m. one day. Two days later, you're gonna do it at 10 a.m. Two days after that, you're gonna do 2 p.m. Then you're gonna do it at 6 p.m. And then you're gonna do it at uh, 11 p.m. late night for Joshua. Five days, exactly the same session, different performances. Now we're gonna say, okay, well, why, why were you so rubbish at five in the morning? Okay. Yeah. We've understood. We've learned a little bit about it. The big thing about that is obviously there's going to be, if we made Josh, and this comes back to control, if we made Joshua do that same session every day at 4 p.m. for a week, there would be a variation in performance. Some days he'd do 10% slower. Some days he'd be 5% faster. So there's, there's natural variation. And so in order to interpret our finding from making good at different times, we have to look over and above that natural variation, does he get even worse than the normal variation? You know what I mean? So, so your control group would be Joshua at the same time every day, and your experiment would be Joshua at five different times. Then you can start to find value in the comparison. Makes sense, eh? Yeah, that's a great yeah. one. That's a great and ideally one. then, what you do is you'd have, again, 10 people do the same thing. Because maybe some people are really good at 5 a.m., maybe not 5 a.m., but 6 a.m., 7 a.m., and other people <laughs> are really good at 6 p.m. or 8 p.m. And then all of a sudden you've made a discovery. You've discovered owls and larks. And that's literally a thing. There are some people who are better at night than in the morning and vice versa. And there's a gene for that. So now all of a sudden you see you've unlocked a whole area of genetic physiology that you wouldn't have known otherwise if you weren't curious. And I guess to some extent they can use the rest of the family, mom and dad and sister and whoever other siblings they have to, to add to that test so that you could get a real nice baseline of what, what the family result might be on an experiment like that <laughs> exactly and then and then you see what you might now discover is that sister susan who's not sporty has wild variation like let's say it's a let's say you make them run 200 meters okay simple task joshua is quite a good athlete he plays a bit of rugby he does it in 27 seconds okay he's young he's getting there but he does 27 seconds susan's not athletic she takes uh, 52 seconds that's their baseline you test Susan every second day for a week and she has these wild variations. One day she runs 41 and the next day she runs 63. Whereas Joshua is 27, 28, 26, 27. Now what you've discovered is that the fitter you are and the more familiar you are with the task, the less variance there is. And all of a sudden you've discovered why it's so valuable to have a homogenous population when you ask these questions because Susan's variation messes up your study. She's a bad subject, yeah. whereas Joshua gives you a reliable baseline from which to assess. So, yeah, you could learn all kinds of things if you just ask the right questions. I've got one more idea, and I'll throw it here. I want to know whether it's a viable one. Um, the, the effects of caffeine versus no caffeine. So I'm thinking if dad, yeah, like cool. me, like yeah. Joshua's yeah. dad, Michael, for instance, uh, has a Watt bike session or a Zwift session with his other mate, like he did this morning, me. Um, and one day he has a shot of espresso um, and the next day he has a decaf. So he doesn't know which is which. And they measure that for a few days and see, and Joshua is the guy that makes the decaf or the, or the caffeine version. 
and yeah. he then tracks how dad did every day and gets a result. So yeah. that's quite a good that's quite a good one, I think. Yeah, that's great because now what you've got is a blinded study. In other words, yeah. your your subject and like we've spoken on this podcast about shoes, like the Nike cheat shoe and the loss of integrity. The problem with that is the moment the guy puts the shoe on, he knows what he's got. Whereas the yeah. study you're talking about now, you can actually be quite clever and you can have Mike do his, let's say it's a, a 10 kilometer cycle time trial every second day. And Joshua gives him either caffeinated or decaffeinated coffee, which yeah. If we put enough sugar in it, we might be able to hide the taste. Let's assume that Mike can't tell apart the uh, the taste of the two. If Mike believes that that coffee works, then he's a candidate for for an effect because of a placebo, right? So now you got to do it again, where you tell Mike that he's getting the coffee, and you actually give him the decaffeinated version, and maybe his performance is the same as if it was, and you've discovered actually that it was all in his head in the first place. So there's so many cool yeah. questions you can ask that way. Again, yeah. Mike, if you do it just on Mike, you run the error of normal variance in performance. You could have a, a random error where he just has a good day with the decaffeinated version and a bad day with caffeine. And you end up like Christy Ashwanden when we spoke to her, concluding that alcohol helps recovery because you just have <laughs> random errors. So ideally what you'd want is Mike plus 10 people or you want to do it on mic 10 times because then you kind yeah. of like deal with the noise, right? So that's a really important principle, but that would be a cool study to do. Like you, you'd be able to quantify how much mic benefits. And again, test it in five people, 10 people, classify them as regular coffee drinkers and non-regular coffee drinkers. And I think you'd find that the people who regularly drink coffee get less of an effect than the people who don't because they're accustomed to caffeine. So you see, once you start asking good questions, there's no limit yeah. to how many good questions you can answer. And that's what research is about. And that's the thing you can teach your kids about through this process. Yeah. Well, that was really good stuff there, Ross. And I think to all of you who are parents out there and uh, want to give them a bit of an insight into what it like, what they would potentially having their little youngsters do at some stage of their careers, um, this is an opportunity to do that. So. If you have found an experiment, whether you use some of our suggestions or you can figure some of out yourself, please don't uh, forget to share them on our Twitter feed, Sports High Pod, and uh, Science of Sport is Ross's uh, is, uh, handle, our Mike Finch SA, and uh, let us know what you think about uh, doing some scientific experiments uh, during this lockdown period. For now, it's uh, goodbye from us, uh, but we look forward to speaking to our next bonus podcast uh, in the next couple of weeks. Ciao.